For those of you who don't know my voice, this is Elizabeth Hardig with the American Planning Association and the Plan for Health Project. And we're excited to have you all here for our nutrition peer call this month. So as a quick reminder, you're welcome to chat questions throughout this initial presentation here, or just unmute your line and ask them over the phone. This is definitely meant to be a conversation, and we're very fortunate to have Lane's expertise on the line. We definitely want to take advantage of that. This call will be recorded, and we'll post it on the Plan for Health website, which I, I'm quite sure you've all had a chance to check out, but I'll go ahead and type in our URL right here. And We've got lots of archived webinars, upcoming events, as well as resources that you're always welcome to use. All right, so let's dive in. So this afternoon, we have Lane Tawalski, who is the Acting Director of Food Policy Director for the District of Columbia Office of Planning. So Lane was previously the lead urban sustainability planner for the Office of Planning, where she was a project manager for the Office of Planning for the Sustainable DC Initiative and plan to make the city the healthiest, greenest, and most livable city in the United States. A tall order there, but you all have done fantastic work. Uh, so the initiative is citywide and crafted for and by DC's diverse community with the ultimate goal of making DC more socially equitable, environmentally responsible, and economically prosperous, which is exactly what we're hoping for with Plan for Health. Uh, Lane also holds a master's degree in city and regional planning and a certificate in urban design from the University of Pennsylvania, as well as a BA degree from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, in environmental studies. She's also um, a member of AICP, and she co-chairs the American Planning Association's Food Interest Group. And for those of you who are on the line who might not be familiar with our interest groups at APA, they're um, similar to divisions. They're by topic areas, so we have the Food Interest Group, as well as the Healthy Communities Interest Group, which might be, um, you're, you're welcome to join. You don't have to be an APA member, and, and it's just a great way to connect with folks and share resources. So I will go ahead and hand things over to you, Lane. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction. Um, so I'm just going to sort of walk a little bit through um, some of what we're doing here in Washington, D.C., and if we want to get into the APA Food Interest Group as well, I'm happy to talk about that, too. Um, they're actually meeting right now just to sort of get ready um, for the upcoming conference and think about what are some priorities for the coming year. So in the district, um, when we talk about the scope of our food system, we're talking about production, processing, distribution, thinking about healthy food access and nutrition issues. We're thinking through, you know, use, how is it actually being handled, distributed, sold, um, what happens to it after we're done with it. You can see my air quotes there, but um, we like to think of uh, food not so much as waste, but as wasted food. Um, you know, it's not necessarily trash or something just to be thrown away. There are other streams for donation or potentially composting or anaerobic digestion that are options for us as well. So that's sort of the universe that I'm talking about. When we look at what's going on in DC right now, we're very deeply divided city in terms of health, in terms of income. Um, Ward 7 and 8 in particular, which are some of our lo lowest income areas, are also our um, areas with the highest percentage of African American and Latino population in the city. They have the highest rates of obesity. They also have the lowest um, rates of walkability in the city. We also see that there is a direct income line. So even if you may say have a grocery store in Ward 8 and one in Ward 3, and you can simply walk to that fairly easily, the ability of what you could buy with an average household income of $257,000 a year in Ward 3 versus $44,000 a year in Ward 8 is really divided. So you may have physical access, but you not, may not have actual access. So we have a, a sort of food access map in the city that shows what we consider to be our version of food deserts. Um, it's a little more fine-grained because we are only 68 square miles than the USDA would consider um, to be food desert areas. They look at a full mile around grocery stores, and we're looking at how easy is it for you to walk there, um, not just drive to a location, because many people don't have access to cars in the city. 
and it's changed over time. So if you look back in 2014 and you look at today, you'll see that we've gotten more grocery stores, um, but the areas that are food insecure have become more food insecure. So there's higher concentration of poverty in those areas. So the people who don't have access are worse off than they were um, two, four, six years ago. I don't mean to paint a bleak picture of what's going on in D.C. We also have a really large number of farmers markets in the city. We have more than 50 full-scale grocery stores. We have um, more than 60 healthy corner stores that are participating in our healthy corner store program. We have new food business incubators um, that are springing up. We have more than 50 community gardens and 100 active school gardens, and we have a number of commercial farms that have started in the past five years. So we do have a lot of food-related assets as well. We also have a lot of legislation that's been put in place really from um, the early 2000s through to today that guides us and has helped to make some of these things possible in the city. We have a Food Policy Council, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more. We have a Healthy Schools Act that set us to a higher standard than really what you could um, require at the federal level when it was initially passed in 2006. Um, we have the Feed DC Act, which incentivizes supermarkets in different areas of the city. Um, we even have an act that um, allows us to bring chickens to schools on a temporary basis so kids can sort of see the whole life cycle from egg um, to growing to egg skin. We also have a couple of key goals for the city when it comes to food. Um, these were included in our original sustainability plan, Sustainable DC. We have one around agriculture, putting more land under cultivation, one around healthy food access and nutrition, um, making sure that residents have good access um, to community food assets, whether those be community gardens, farmers markets, or healthy corner stores, and also full service grocery stores. And we want to also focus on the local food sector and to get more of our food from within the local region. Um, so we have a food policy council, the DC FPC, um, that just started this past August. And it has a couple of key objectives about what it's trying to achieve. We're trying to promote food access, food sustainability, and food economy. We're trying to look at what those regulatory barriers might be um, in the city and think through how can we remove them, how can we change the existing rules and regulations to make it, things work better, to help support these businesses and organizations. We do an annual assessment of our local food system, so we then share that information with the council and with our council members and the mayor and have recommendations for where we see policy might need to be changed. And we look at national best practices, what's just going on around the country and around the world that we may want to be aware of in terms of how we direct our policy. So we sort of act with the 12-member board um, and 10 different district agencies who are somehow involved in food, whether they're our Department of Health or our Department of Parks and Recreation or the Office of Planning. We're designed to be a forum for discussing food issues um, to help coordinate among the district government and all these different great community organizations and businesses that are involved in the food system um, to evaluate and then recommend and actually change policy and potentially to work on specific programs um, that would help us meet some of those larger food goals for the city. So what do I do in this context? Um, I'm trained uh, in background to be a planner and to work on sustainability related issues, to work on design related issues. Um, so my sort of job is to help collaborate with the surrounding jurisdictions in the region so that we're fitting into the larger food system of the region as a whole to help us get grants and partnerships to make some of this stuff happen, um, to help make the process easier for food businesses and organizations to work with the, the policies and permits that we have now um, to help support and promote local food economy. Um, to help us figure out how do we meet those goals, and to, to really just make it easier um, to be involved in the local food economy. So that's a lot, um, but I think it's really uh, can be described as sort of a, 
a connector and catalyst kind of role. Our job is to bring people together to have these open conversations with members of the community about food, about health, about nutrition and food access, and to, to have a way to be there to have a conduit back and forth between different communities and look at the big picture. Uh, so a little title blooper here, but this is just sort of a, gives you a sense of how we work together. We have the general community and stakeholders, anybody in the city who's affected by our food policy. We have four um, formal working groups that sort of go into the nitty gritty on some of these issues. Um, we have the Food Policy Council, that's the 12 appointed members. We're an official board and commission of the district. And then we have me, the sort of staff who helps support um, that whole organization. So the four groups that we have right now, they've just um, had their first meetings this month. The last one was last night. Um, we have one on local food business and labor, one on food equity, access, and health and nutrition education, um, one on sustainable food procurement, one on urban agriculture and food system education. So as you can see, we're trying to tackle a lot, and there's naturally a bit of overlap between the groups and organizations. But we have them as targeted groups to really get into the details of some of our existing policies. But then we all come back together as the full Food Policy Council and think through how each of our work affects the other um, and how those cross-cutting issues come up. Um, so what's coming up? For us as a Food Policy Council and for Food Policy in DC, um, we have some funding in place. It's not $16 million for the Food Policy Council as a whole, but rather for um, just funding that has gone to food-related projects in the city. We're completing our food system assessment, looking at sort of the existing conditions of where we are now. We're working on editing some urban agriculture legislation that's in the process of going through some amendments. Um, we're looking at ways to improve food access, especially in Ward 7 and 8 that I mentioned earlier, those low food access areas. Um, and we're going to be conducting a study on our local food economy just to understand its influence on the larger city economy and jobs um, in the coming year. And we're also looking at LA's good food procurement policy, um, especially for our school system when we're thinking about school food. So that's sort of an overview of where we are right now. Um, I wanted to leave some time for questions for in conversation, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions either via chat or, or phone or voice that anyone might have. Great. Thank you so much. That was a fabulous overview. And I did actually attend the, the very first meeting in August, um, which was really fun and energetic and lots of um, folks in the room who were excited about the council, it seemed, and you had a great, a great lineup of, of official directors or kind of the guiding um, group at the, at the, the front table there. Um, so folks, please feel free to unmute your lines. You're welcome to ask Lane a question directly or chat them in, just, just like um, we mentioned. Um, maybe for a quick starter question for folks who are thinking about their own food policy councils or really continuing their coalition work and, and bringing in other sectors and other partners, could you talk a little bit about how you ended up recruiting the members for your council, or kind of the, the, the guiding um, body? It sounded like folks were appointed, but I'm sure you were very intentional about getting different perspectives and different sectors involved. Um, so we um, went through, we have an official mayor's office of talent appointments. That was sort of the official venue to get members involved, but we also um, just sort of put out the word to the community, the food community, whether it's healthy food access or food-related businesses, to, uh, to try and get people on board um, who might be interested. So we probably had maybe 75 people apply for 12 spots, um, which was great to see that level of interest and support um, in the community among just different groups and organizations. And the way the memberships work is that they're tiered a bit, so people rotate off and on so the whole board doesn't turn over since it is a new board at once. Um, and that way, we'll, we'll have an opportunity to get in some of those people who maybe weren't able to be included in the first round in the next couple of years on a rotating basis. Um, but we have a really diverse um, mix of people. We have people from nutrition backgrounds, people from food access, people who are in the food entrepreneurs, venture capital space, um, people who work with food banks, um, people who are 
directly urban farming, so it's a nice diverse mix of people who are involved and also geographically diverse throughout the city. That's great, and I, I noticed um, in the working group invites, you all were very, it, it looked like you were very intentional about having the meetings in different parts of the city and, and making sure that we're practicing what we preach when it comes to, to making this, this accessible to folks. I'm definitely trying to. <laughs> Ongoing effort. Mm -hmm. Well, and I have to say, I think for some planners, the kind of active transportation and physical activity side of the Plan for Health project and, and um, chronic disease prevention work in general seems like a, a more you know, obvious fit. But would you mind talking a little bit about how your position came to be within the Office of Planning? And, and if you wouldn't mind maybe sharing a little bit about your, your own background. Sure. Um, so the position was created as part of the legislation that also created the Food Policy Council. And they sort of um, both arose out of a couple of roundtables that were held by council members on urban agriculture and healthy food access and school procurement. and the more um, these issues were sort of looked at in the public eye, the more clear it was that there wasn't really one person who was just dedicated to working on these issues. Everyone has their sort of um, pet role within district government. You know, we have our um, local farm to school coordinator. We have our um, health nutrition educator person. We have someone who does permitting for farmers markets, but nobody was looking at the big picture. So. It was clear that there was a need for someone to help coordinate and make sure that these different rules and regulations and entities weren't contradicting each other, which in some cases they are, um, in terms of what our priorities are as a city. So when that legislation passed, um, it created my position, and then the following year funding was put in place for that. Um, so that was new to be within the office. And there was some discussion, should it be in the mayor's office, should it be in the office of planning, since they work on land use um, and sort of long range planning issues for the city. And they ultimately decided to, to put it here. Um, so I sort of ended up applying for it because of my own interest um, in food related issues and some of the food related work I'd done through the sustainable DC plan. Mm -hmm. Great. And, and I. I appreciate that that um, you mentioned, of course, you know the the role of built environment in, in making accessible places, but then kind of that the the programming side as well, and the, the complement to that. And so it certainly makes sense to have a planner as a convener and catalyst, looking at the big picture, but also balancing the the policy side with the community engagement and the programming side, um, which. You know, of course, Plan for Health, our priority is, is thinking about policy systems and environment, but then finding a way to engage community members and other planners and folks in kind of direct activities and nutrition education or something like that uh, is, is, can be a nice pathway into um, maintaining and sustaining our, our policy recommendations. Definitely, and I think one of the perks about being located in the Office of Planning in particular is that, you know, I'm around the other planners who are, are working on specific on the ground issues. So, you know, when an issue comes up, like a zoning case for a supermarket and a low food access area, I get the chance to sort of interact and help push for those issues um, in that area or um, when it comes to making sure that we include food and nutrition and um, active living issues into our comprehensive plan, there's a chance to do that, which is helpful because the planning work in particular sort of spreads out across so many other offices and government divisions. Mm -hmm. That is very true. We are everywhere. <laughs> um, well, I just want to pause a moment. I, I noticed a couple of other folks joined the conversation, and maybe I'll push the slides back just a, a little bit so we can look at some of the great um, maps that you shared about DC and uh, and how we're thinking about um, really targeting vulnerable communities and, and making sure that we're supporting, of course, everyone in the city and the district, but, but really recognizing that uh, Ward 7 and 8 um, are experiencing a very different food environment than, than Ward 3. This slide is, I, I think you may have shared this at the first Food Policy Council meeting, and I, I 
didn't fully comprehend those numbers until I saw your slide, and it is quite, quite a difference there. It's very stark, and actually I should add, these numbers are from 2009, and the population of the city has gone up exponentially from then, and most of the people who are moving into the city are young, in their 20s to 30s, highly educated, um, and earning pretty high incomes as well. So you should expect that this is actually a little lower than probably what it is today as well. Mm -hmm. Well, and I am relatively new to the D.C. area myself, and I, it's been interesting to, to think about the regional perspective when, when just next door we've got all these other states. Um, and I, I noticed a few folks um, in, our, in the room today are from rural areas or are thinking about a much larger geographic um, just space. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that regional perspective and, and how you kind of facilitate conversation or connection with, with your peers or colleagues who are representing different jurisdictions? Um, so one thing that we're really lucky to have here is we're a member of the Regional Council of Governments in our area. And they, um, through the USDA Department of Agriculture, recently got um, a connector um, to help us with food-related issues and improving in um, local procurement through the Food Link program. So they have a staff person who's hired on for three years um, to sort of help push and work on regional cooperation. And she has been convening meetings on um, local freight and distribution, um, helping to sort of coordinate among the whole Chesapeake Bay shed area, um, so not just the surrounding counties around Washington, D.C. Um, and they also hold um, regional agriculture meetings, and not just in D.C., but out in the different counties in Virginia and Maryland surrounding um, the city so that people don't have to travel as far from their area. So she's thinking very thoughtfully about how to hold the meeting to get the people that you want in the conversation there. And I think for us, it's really helpful because we want, we're, you know, we're sort of a consumer. We, we um, are drawing a lot of food from the surrounding region and really from around the country, and others are offering and looking to, you know, get food out of their areas, get it sold, and get it to the consumer market. So having the chance for us to make those connections has been really, really been helpful. It's sort of new. She's only been hired um, for the past four or five months, but I, I think there's a lot of opportunity for us. Oh, that's fabulous. That's really great. Um, and I think procurement in particular is, is an issue that I'm not as familiar with. Um, and in just in a few of our Plan for Health coalitions, it's, it's popped up. Um, and thinking, keeping that regional perspective and really kind of you know, leveling up and, and looking at the big picture seems to be um, the ideal situation. Frankly, I know that with a couple of our, our coalitions, they were targeting local hospitals and really thinking about uh, changing procurement policies within specific institutions, and um, they, they ran into a couple of roadblocks there. It's <laughs> it, can be, it can be tough to even make those, those smaller changes, um, so really kind of connecting into that broader perspective um, is really exciting and, and sounds really fabulous. And of course, having a staff person there to facilitate that is, is, is ideal. Yeah, definitely. Um. I would also give a little shout out to Philadelphia. I was just on a call right before this, and they have done uh, a sector-based pledge. They tried to get to the healthcare sector to improve um, healthy food access within the hospitals for employees and for um, and for you know occupants of the hospital itself, people who are there as patients. And they've been really doing some interesting work. So we would definitely love to. Um, totally copy them and, and learn from what they've done and, and do something similar here. Yeah, that's fabulous. I haven't heard of that. that I will have to, to pass that on to um, I have one coalition in mind who would be delighted to, to hear more. <laughs> it's, um, the healthcare sector is such a great potential partner, but um, that was the very institution where we ran into a couple of roadblocks, as sometimes is the case. 
Well, we just have a few minutes left, and I wondered if you could talk um, a little bit about the food interest group at APA and, and kind of what that means exactly and, and how folks could potentially tap into that, whether they're planners or, or not. Public health folks are always welcome to. Sure. Um, so it's designed to, to be sort of a clearinghouse of resources in a way for people who are working in different parts of food systems um, to connect with each other. And I think there's a lot of interest in the topic right now, so we have a lot of people sort of coming to us and asking questions and trying to find um, research. We have a couple of working groups for that group, one on education, one on research, one on policy, and one that sort of helps us with communication. So there's ways to actively get involved in the food system interest group. We also have a website, just apafig.wordpress.com, and where we have a ton of great pieces of research that have been compiled either by Growing Food Connections that helped to oversee the food interest group, um, and was partially funded through the Planning Association um, and um, just other people who are interested in these issues. We also post jobs related to food systems planning um, on there in addition to referring them to APA National. So um, it's just a great sort of clearinghouse of resources and then annually at the national conference we have our sort of network meeting and talk through business issues, what do people want to focus on in the coming year in terms of how we spend our time as an interest group and then just fun networking as well so people can get to know each other. Um, we've done, um, oh thanks for posting those in the chat, uh, Elizabeth, um, but we also have done um, a series of sort of profiles because um, I think a lot of people get confused and they say, well, what does it mean to be a food system planner? So we have a, a series of profiles on the website called Faces of Food System Planning where we interview people who are food system planners. They might work for nonprofits or for profits. Um, they might work for government and they sort of talk through what do they do on a daily basis and you know, what are they trying to achieve for the larger food system through their work. And people have seemed to really like those because you get a, a real feeling for what do you really do? What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I like that series. Um, we should maybe that's something to add to Plan for Health. Just faces of Plan for Health. Um, yeah. Well, this has been a really fabulous uh, presentation and conversation. I I really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. And I, I just want to. We have one minute left. I wanted to see if questions have popped up, for folks. Um, you're of course always welcome to send me an email, and I'm happy to follow up with Lane. And I can pull up that last slide that includes your contact information. So let me head back there. Great. Well, thank you again for being with us, Lane. And I'm sure we will be seeing each other at, at Food Policy Council meetings or, or elsewhere. And thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.